Now it is. Okay. In right. five, four, three, two. Oh. Hello and welcome back to another episode of A Cold Laden DJ as we roll into DSLR from new podcast episode number 93. Mitch from Planet 5D joins me today to discuss some new monitors, some recorders, and some other items on our list of news today. But first, Mitch, what have you been up to, sir? I, I finally got my sound effect. Da -da -da. Nice. Talking over myself, isn't that cool? Uh, had a great time yesterday on the... Photography of Director podcast, so that'll be up in a couple of weeks. I bet you've never heard of that one. It's a brand new cinematographer podcast. Oh, wow. And uh, You know, someone should really gather up all of the uh, film-related podcasts and put them into one easy-to-find location. Hint, I, Mitch. That would be a great idea. Hint, hint, Mitch. Um, yeah, there are a lot of good ones out there, actually, and uh, I, I was I was rather talkative yesterday because uh, Vitaly kept asking me questions about me, so <laughs> I talked a lot. I was actually uh, one I used to listen to all the time uh, that has recently gone away is the RC. I don't know if you're familiar with that, uh, but uh, those guys had been going for five or six years strong, probably one episode a month. Uh, originally focused around red cameras, but uh, covered quite a bit of stuff, and it was sad to see them go. They left, huh? I didn't yeah, I, I don't think it's uh, it's very lucrative to be a camera podcaster, so they had other things that they needed to get done. Yeah. And yeah. as you guys can see, I'm still sick. Um, I have been shooting on the Sony A7S Mark II, which did replace my 5D Mark III. And other than that, uh, laying in bed with uh, lots of NyQuil. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the news because I think it's about that time. Time for the news. Time for the news. Time for the news. First on the list here is actually a new monitor. Uh, this is kind of interesting, kind of weird, um, not what I was expecting actually. Uh, Shogun and the Ninja, these are both uh, Atomus uh, products that you're familiar with. They've upgraded these to the Flame, uh, continuing to stick with their weaponed and weaponized naming scheme. So both of these will be the Flame. Uh, the idea here is that both of them are capable of producing very bright screens. The separation between these two, of course, again, is the SDI versus HDMI inputs. And uh, they're sporting uh, some HDR applications as well as a more intuitive touchscreen system. Now, Mitch, what do you think about these monitors? Uh, are field recorders like this becoming good enough that we no longer need to have a dedicated monitor? These look pretty impressive. Uh, I have not had my hands on one yet. I thoroughly anticipate spending a lot of time in the Atomos booth because it's one of the most massive booths you ever did see. Uh, plus, they usually have naked women in their booths. So, um, <laughs> um, I think it's very interesting that they have realize that being out in the wild is often a very difficult thing with a monitor so they've really boosted the nits on this yeah, 1500 i think is the is the new output value yeah and that's that's pretty dead gum bright um i was looking at the news shooter article this morning and i think they said that the the brightest other one on the market is one of the small hd ones and it comes in at like 600 or 700 nits. So this is this is pretty dead gum bright compared to everything else. Wow. Now, what do you know about the whole HDR that they're advertising with this? Well, I, HDR is is an interesting concept, right? Uh, we in photography, we've all gotten used to those crazy guys that were doing quote unquote HDR with taking three or four photos and merging them together and making absolutely everything bright uh, and ugly. If you ask me. <laughs> some of the traditional HDR was, was pretty grotesque and, and you know, you don't need to see all the shadows and everything that's in the shadows all the time. Uh, they're claiming that with, the HDR mode turned on that you'll get 10 levels of dynamic range, which is pretty unusual from a monitor. Uh, I don't think I've ever really thought about 
how much dynamic range is available on monitors, but you know, we're always talking about the sensor of a camera, uh, but typically monitors are small little tiny devices that are just used for uh, not so much color correction on screen. I mean, uh, in the field, you're not doing color correction, but you know, determining lighting and, and everything else. Uh, a lot of people, including Shane, would probably pull out a real monitor. I, mean, I, I know they travel around with monitors all the time instead of and using anything that's this small. Well, a lot of uh, televisions are limited to what about seven ish as far as uh, stops of dynamic range from the darkest point to the lightest point. And for yeah. those of you not familiar with HDR, that's high dynamic range. It's just a way of referencing the darkest point in an image to the lightest point in the image with the ability to still bring out any kind of uh, detail information between those ranges. Uh, so if a TV is 7 and you turn some switch on on this Shogun Flame and now you get 10, what does that get you? <laughs> In in actuality, in in reading the, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to start having problems like you. Uh, well, the sick are, club. Yeah, the sick club. Uh, the interesting thing about it is that in in the HDR mode, what they're anticipating is that you'll be able to focus better because you'll be able to see more and it will uh, appear sharper to you, and therefore your focus will be better as opposed to necessarily just using uh, any kind of a focus assist. So that's one of the reasons. Of course, the other reason is if you're shooting in something like S-Log or C-Log and your customer wants to be able to see a, a, a more final kind of image than shooting, than displaying it in HDR, they'll get to see more of the image a little bit more like it will be in the final form. So inbuilt LUTs in this thing, as well as uh, internal recording, we still have the DNX HD ProRes 422 recording capabilities. It's a 7-inch monitor, very bright. Uh, the other addition to the Shogun Flame and Ninja Flame is the option to have two batteries. Now, if you remember in the original Shogun and Ninja, they only had one battery, so you didn't have the option to switch out batteries live. And these things do go through batteries fairly fast. Same SD capabilities, so you can shove in any 2.5-inch SD or SSD drive into the Ninja or Shogun Flame, Ninja Flame, Shogun Flame. Uh, so either one of those are capable. Also, uh, do you know if the 120 frames per second at 1080p is a new option, or was that available in the original uh, uh, Shogun? I'm afraid I don't have an answer for you. Uh, so uh, take a look at those, guys. It's an uh, interesting addition the pricing is pretty reasonable we're talking about $1295 for an HDMI only version and $1695 for the Shogun SDI version now Mitch why is it, why is it such a price difference uh, SDI modules uh, make you a little more professional so they cost more uh, plus there's actually some proprietary business to go along with an SDI connector for video uh, I don't think that in reality the parts and the licensing cost as much as they do in the price discrepancy, but uh, uh, there is a margin marginal difference, probably two hundred bucks, three hundred bucks, something like that. Okay, thanks. But uh, what I was going to ask you, Mitch, is even though we have these field recorders that are capable of of gathering good ProRes and uh, DNX H HD out of our cameras. Do you really want to run around with this giant seven inch monitor with large batteries and a hard drive in it attached to something like uh, this tiny little camera right here? <laughs> no, uh, I don't. It, but it depends upon what your needs are. Uh, and and <laughs> if you're carrying around a monitor, which I have done on occasion, right? A little five inch or seven inch monitor. Uh, if it happens to do a recording on the back end, then that makes it all the more appealing to be able to have with you when you need it. Uh, again, for what I do where I go film a little product review or something, it's overkill for me. I typically would end up using my Flippy Dippy uh, T4i and just use the little tiny monitor on that, just do framing and stuff. So. Well, just an example here, guys. This is the original Ninja, and here is the Sony A7S Mark II. 
and the Ninja is heavier and about twice the size. Now these new monitors are thinner, but with the battery powered system and everything else that goes into that, uh, they get rather, rather large. Um, I would generally put these at twice or at least one and a half times the weight of your camera and lens. And that's a lot to carry around. And I've seen people give up on their field monitors after only a few months worth of use simply because it was such a hassle to build an arm up, build up an entire rig and then hook everything together. Yeah. I don't, and that actually brings me to this next <laughs> news item, which when I, when I saw this, Mitch, and I don't even know what this is called exactly. Look at this monstrosity. This thing is basically a computer shoved into a box that's capable of recording uh, 4K, I believe 444, and it is easily labeled uh, the 5.6 inch UHD QHD OLED monitor recorder. Uh, and this is an Indiegogo campaign. Mitch, can you tell me more about this weird uh, box slash field recorder? <laughs> slash PC slash uh, dishwasher. <laughs> and sink. Uh, this is from a company called Cine Martin, who has been a Planet 5D sponsor, so I have to admit that right up front. Uh, this product is actually called the, gosh, I've forgotten. They've given it two names. They've got two of them, the Mini M and the TO, and that's T-E-O. And I didn't realize until you found it, by the way, that they actually started this uh, Indiegogo campaign. Uh, but they put out a press release uh, yesterday about this. Uh, Cine Martin has been famous for doing things like the uh, H.265 compression. Uh, they're I, they're the, about the only people that I know, and they might be the only ones that are doing H.265 in a field recorder. Uh, so you could, if if you were there and ready to start doing H.265 stuff, they're the guys to go see. They're out of uh, Italy, I believe. Um, so this device is, and they've had a bigger one. I actually saw a review, and I and I was going to look it up, and I apologize because I didn't get that done. Wait, there's a bigger version of this thing? They've had it out for about a year because it has, it ha like I said, it has a PC in it. So, so their concept here is you take this device out, and you take a, a, a keyboard and a mouse with you, and you can not only shoot, but you can record, right? And you can monitor with it. And then once you've recorded, you can edit. You can it, it comes with Windows Pro on on the PC, uh, or you can install Mac OS 10 if you want. As, and you could put Adobe, all the Adobe suite and, and everything else on it. Plus, you can do live streaming with it. So you can, I mean, this is an all-in-one kitchen sink kind of thing. Wow. That instead of carrying multiple PCs and monitors and all this other stuff, if you've got a keyboard and a mouse, you can do everything you want to do with this. And I mean, you can even attach USB devices because it has four, it's four USB inputs. It's got the monitor. I mean, it's uh, the uh, you can attach a monitor, and you know, like if you uh, you can attach two 4K monitors to it, so you can do all of your editing with it. So it's it's like, like I said, I mean, it's a kitchen sink. It's got, I mean, what else would you need if you're going out and shooting something? So um, it looks like Mitch, this yeah, might right. be based around uh, Intel's Nook, their their little tiny computer devices. Um, this is basically a off-the-shelf uh, PC that Intel makes that has an i7 processor jammed into it with very limited space. And looking at the design of this and reading over the information in the Indiegogo campaign, it does appear as though they have just jammed a Intel Nook into this device and then their proprietary software as well as interfaces in order to accomplish this. Uh -huh. That's pretty crazy what do you think about that much computing power in something like this, this is a laptop it's, replacement it's crazy. It, that's i mean not Weird laptop <laughs> not your typical it's not your grandma's laptop uh, <laughs> but and and i the the big question which of course they're trying to figure out with doing the indiegogo 
campaign is, is there a real market for this? Uh, how many people, I mean, let's suppose you're going up to, uh, you know, the Arctic Circle, right? And you want to minimize what you're carrying, but you still want to be able to shoot and edit while you're there. And maybe even live stream, right? If you had some sort of connection <laughs> to a satellite or something. I'm, I'm exaggerating, but it does give you the capabilities of being remote and being able to do everything in a really small package and not have to have multiple devices in order to do it. How much of there is there a need for that? I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question, which is what they're trying to find out. Well, looking at the specs, guys, you can get this with a 5.6-inch monitor. Uh, it is a 4K display, which is pretty impressive for something that size. Uh, the light output isn't crazy, but pretty well within range of standard monitors. Capable of recording 4444 internally, has an uh, option for 16 or 32 gigs of RAM, and, of course, Adobe Cloud support. A oh, Holy cow. <laughs> Hey, the list goes on and on and yeah, on. Yeah, this is just this is just the specs of a really good computer. Basically, uh, reading through this, so I mean, you want a really decent tiny computer for about two thousand uh, dollars? That sort of feels like what these guys are offering here. Yeah, it, plus a recorder, right? I mean, it's got a monitor. I mean, a free monitor with your computer. <laughs> you can you can have uh, SSD drives up to two terabytes. Uh, you know, you, you got everything you need in there. Do you know what the weight is on this by chance, Mitch? It's, I mean, it's actually pretty small. It's, it fits in the palm of your hand, right? Okay. Look at their, their images on Indiegogo. Uh, I didn't pay much attention to the weight, and I don't see it in my list of specs because uh, we did write this up on Planet ID. But, I mean, you, you've got this list of specs that just goes on and on. And you're like, what else do I put in the list? I know. That, okay, here's a picture, guys, uh, for those of you watching. Uh, this is the monitor next to someone's hand, and it is fairly reasonably sized. It doesn't look much worse than the Ninja I was holding up just a little bit ago, actually. Notice in that photo, by the way, that they've put it with the, can uh, with the Sony A7S, I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> they put the biggest lens they could find on this, um, <laughs> just to make it look bigger, I think. Wow. But uh, interesting product. I don't know what the market level is for that. Uh, we'll have to see. But Cine Martin is is stretching the borders of of the future concept. I mean, you know, an iPhone does quite a few things, right? I mean, it's a monitor and it's a recorder. And now, Mitch, you're familiar with uh, small HD and. Last year, they released a monitor that had some uh, SD card inputs, but uh, does not have internal recording. Do you think they're going to jump on the bandwagon of uh, field recorders, uh, similar to something like the uh, Blackmagic uh, monitor that was released last year? I, they make some great products, and I don't know. I was I was actually kind of surprised last year that they hadn't done that. Uh, I don't. I haven't talked to them. Uh, I don't know what their future directions are. It would seem to me to make sense that if they've got people that really love their gear and they, they do have a huge audience. I mean, you, you've been by the small HD booth at NAB. And it's oh, yeah. Packed. And I own a lot of small HD gear. Their monitors are great. Uh, I, I have no complaints about any of their stuff. Right. So it's it's it has been a question of mine as to when whether they were going to come out with something and it obviously is a question in your mind so well i got to thinking as i was seeing the image of that with the sd card i remembered small rig or small hd had the sd card input and then i was also thinking they got acquired by a parent company that does uh, wireless uh, broadcasting stuff for remote monitoring you know, either one of those features would be beautiful to see in the tiny 502. I, I think I believe it's the 502 and 702. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. 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 Monitors. Those are beautiful little monitors, uh, way smaller and way more uh, resolution than you got out of previous generations of, of monitors. Uh, combine those two together. And I mean, that sounds pretty sexy, right? Well, and that's why this device from Cine Martin has live streaming in it. It's, it's got everything. <laughs> Man. Okay, so basically, <laughs> folks, if you want to buy a computer, 
And it's this is only a, a, a it looks like about two thousand dollars for one of the entry level models. Uh, so only about six hundred bucks more than the uh, Ninja Flame, and you can have an entire editing computer in your hand. I don't know what you're going to do with it, but if you get one, please send me pictures. I would love to see that. Yeah. All right. Moving on down the line to some free software. Uh, if you're not familiar with Snapseed, uh, Google bought them up a couple of years ago and they've kind of just lingered. They had a lot of really interesting plugins that were available for Lightroom and other applications. And for a while, they were selling those uh, plugins for about $150. Uh, last week, it looks like Google released those out into the world for free. So that's $150 value now available for free. Uh, you can download these plugins and install them into After Effects, Aperture, and whatever a photo editing program you use. Mitch, does this excite you at all? Do you think uh, a company from three years ago is offering up something that uh, we aren't seeing in modern iterations of these photo editing apps? I don't don't have a whole lot of experience with Nick because I didn't want to pay the original $500 for the entire suite. Wow, it was 500 to begin with? Before Google bought them and started selling it for 150 yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I was reading yesterday, and this just came out yesterday. It wasn't last week, by the way. Um, a lot of people were really excited about it. And, of course, those people that paid $150 are now stomping their feet. Um, and Google has said that <coughs> just it, <coughs> by the way. See, you cough, and my throat starts getting a little frog in it. Thanks. You just passed it down the wire. I'm sorry, guys. And also, I want to apologize for being so sick I'm not my normal self today, as Mitch is like, he's staring at me smiling like, this guy, he's got nothing today. DJ's just out of his mind. No, I can't even say what week this uh, freaking thing came out. That's crazy. Okay, that's why I'm here, is to cover your fanny. Uh, but, so so if you happen to have purchased it anytime after January 1st, uh, Google's going to give you your money back, which is kind of nice. They don't have to do that. And why they're doing it for free, I don't know. Other than the implication is that Maybe uh, the sales haven't been going well, and maybe they're not going to do any upgrades to it as the future goes on. So maybe it's an end of life kind of thing that they're uh, just going, All right here. You go. I mean, that's that's what people are wondering. They're like, uh oh. <laughs> I would almost su suspect they would uh, roll this into you know Google Photos because they've started to add sort of photo editing options in Google Photos. Maybe something like this in combination with Google Photos would be a, a better way to utilize these uh, uh, these plugins for you know brightness, uh, noise reduction, and so on. Right. Yeah. Are, are you a Google Photos user, by the way, Mitch? I have not done that yet. Uh, I I continue to use my good old pals over at Smug Mug for my stuff. Um, I don't. I, it's interesting because the, apparently the Nick collection is also a, can be run standalone, so you can do them as standalone products as well. Uh, so they're plugins. Uh, I downloaded it yesterday just because I'm like, oh, it's free. I'm going to download it, but I have I haven't managed to make any time to do anything with it, and I probably won't because I still spend a lot of time in Aperture. Uh, I know how that works, and I don't know why I would really spend any time working with these things. Now, one thing I use quite regularly, and it's a fairly handy plugin for Chrome, it's called Polar. And if you look at an image, and I'll show you one right now, every image that ever shows up on my screen, it'll give you this little icon in the corner. And as soon as you click on that, it basically brings up a full-fledged uh, photo editing suite that allows you to do real basic curves, uh, cropping, uh, any kind of edits that you would normally do in Photoshop, and it's it's pretty f uh, not Photoshop in Lightroom, and it's pretty full fledged. Like you have gamma, light exposure, all your curves, your histograms, everything else, all the things that you would normally uh, think of. Would you recommend going to a free application like this for people who are just starting out? And when I say that, I compare that to something like uh, Canon's professional software disk that comes with each Canon camera. Would something like this give them a little bit better taste of a more professional editing environment? Uh, I don't know. I've never used this Polar um, plugin, and I guess it depends. Um, I, I know there are plenty of, of free tools, and I know there are plenty of people that use the Canon, um, what I think is it's it? Canon Professional or something. 
like that or CP. Yeah, yeah, something like that. <laughs> uh, and and there are there are all sorts of different tools out there, uh, and it blows me away as to why some people use one over another. I just I'm it's it's kind of an experience level thing. Uh, I guess if you if you're really broke and want to save money, the the free ones work. But I've always paid for for the higher level stuff. Yeah, Panasonic is the worst offender. Their free uh, photo editing app that comes with the GH4 is basically useless unless you pay for the upgraded version, which is a couple hundred dollars. Uh, Nikon's basic stuff looks pretty solid. So does Canon's, but uh, there's a lot of stuff missing that you don't get in normal right. photo editing applications. And uh, the difference between something like Polar, uh, GIMP is another one that's free, uh, and those basic ones that come with your camera is that they start to give you sort of, I don't want to say big boy tools, but, uh, but fairly close. I mean, you get noise reduction, vignette control, you get your histograms, you get a lot of the things that aren't necessarily done well or aren't very intuitive or aren't available at all in these basic free editing right. programs that come with your camera. Uh, I've never actually, I own several Sony cameras and I've never actually gotten any Sony software to find out, you know, how it works. So I, I can't comment on that, but I probably should give it a try. Well, the, uh, yeah, the thing, the thing about the, the Canon professional thing, the DCP or whatever the heck it's called, and I apologize, Canon, because I don't remember every name known to man. Uh, it's, it's user interface is clunky as hell. And it's like, you know, you, if, if you've started using something like Lightroom or Aperture, and you have to go back to something that is 15 year old kind of user interface you're like uh okay never mind it has a lot of great functionality in it especially specifically tuned for canon cameras and nikon software is the same way and i'm sure sony's is too uh you know there are there are some certain tweaks in there that you could probably do very well but i don't i just i don't go there there was that remote control app uh, that made it easy to control your camera from a distance and set things up for photographers, that, which is kind of nice. Right. Uh, the other one is you can update your lens profiles in your Canon body via right. the app. So right. there are reasons to use it. It's just, I don't know. And then that whole ridiculous thing where you had to have the CD in order to upgrade. And for a long time, they made it sort of impossible to get a copy of the software. Uh -huh. If you didn't have the CD in your box and a lot of times people throw out that junk or, you know, it gets smashed or they install it in one computer and then they have to use, you know, weird workarounds in order to get it from Canon, like call them and, and complain and get something, a uh, special link sent to them or something like that. It, it isn't until what last year, maybe the year before that Canon finally started offering that as a download, as long as you entered in the uh, serial number of your camera. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. Uh, that I remember that I'm just smiling and gently chuckling because it was like, it's like what are you thinking, Canon? I mean, uh, it's not like pirates are out there to get a copy of your photo editing software. Yeah, well, you you buy it because you have a Canon camera, duh. Yeah, uh, I agree. Yeah, I remember. That. <laughs> Speaking of Canon, let's talk about the X. C10, the XC10, a camera I've never really loved, never really had much of a, a care for. Uh, it's now down, by the way, to around 1500 bucks if you're into a 4K one inch uh, camera. So if you're looking, I'm looking here on sales on eBay, 1431, 1537. Uh, prices have really come down pretty significantly on this guy. And it now, from Canon rumors, there are rumors that a major firmware update may be coming to the XC10. Mitch, what do you think they could add to this camera that would reinvigorate it and make it more attractive to filmmakers? Uh, I, I, I'm again laughing. It's a laughing show for me. Uh, <laughs> because I, I spent five minutes going through the Canon rumors uh, forum this morning, and people are are funny <laughs> uh, because somebody, a couple of people said, well, maybe if they could add a firmware update to allow you to uh, remove the lens and put a different camera lens. What? You know, I, they're joking, you know, the, obviously because it's a fixed lens camera. Uh, it's, it's not an interchangeable lens. So they're having a lot of fun with it. And of course, 
I've said this before and I'll say it again, this camera was not designed for everybody. It was more of a camera that was meant for uh, people, for example, who are maybe reporters or people going out to NAB in the show floor, need something quick with a fixed lens on it that, you know, it's a zoom, does what they need it to do, records 4K, uh, maybe put it on a drone. Again, it wasn't designed for you and I as filmmakers. And for all the people in Canon Rumors and everywhere else that continue to bash Canon, I mean, one guy said it was the stupidest camera ever invented. And I, it wasn't meant for him. It obviously was not designed for him. Somebody else chimes in on the Canon Rumors forum, forum and says, I love it. I use it all the time. Uh, it's a great little camera for what I need it for. And he didn't go into a whole lot of details about it. was he using it for. So there are people out there that have bought it and love it. And so no offense to those of you who love to bash things, but there's a market for this. Canon obviously has a small market. They built it for a particular group of people and it's selling. Well, and to be fair to this camera, actually, Mitch, uh, there are some things that they could add to a major firmware update that could increase the quality that you get out of this camera, uh, mainly the 4K Kodak. Uh, this does have one of the more robust, robust 4K Kodaks available. Uh, I think it's a 300-ish meg Kodak. They could increase that to maybe, you know what, I bet they could push it to 400 without overrunning an SD card and get a little bit more... Uh, resolution, may, uh, nah, maybe a little bit more color space out of that, uh, maybe H.265 availability, something like that. Uh, those are things that could legitimately be done. Um, I don't know what else. I was trying to think maybe in-camera noise reduction might be a valid excuse to make this a little bit better. I know this is rated to 20,000 ISO, but uh, the XC10, uh, I can't imagine is much of a low light performer. Maybe some in-camera noise reduction might be able to allow you to go up to 3,200 or 6,400 ISO. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I'm trying to be nice here because I, I see what you're saying about this camera and I don't hate it. I just, it's not for me specifically. But, but I wonder what you could do with a major firmware update for this that would make it but, compelling. Let me update you. I mean, I'm just jumping back over them. One of the guys in Canon Rumors says, well, it's light adjustable. Uh, it's got a rotating grip. Uh, it's got one of Canon's best codecs with the 4K log. Yep. Built-in uh, ND filter, which most of the other cameras don't have. Autofocus with face tracking. Uh, Time-lapse mode, which great makes great 4K videos. Uh, so this guy, this guy likes it. Now, there was one other post, if I can get my browser to back up quickly. Uh, he would like... Uh, it, the f-stop only goes to f11, which I didn't realize. Really? It also only does a focus magnification of 2x. So he would like to see that improved. Um, the focus touch doesn't work in 4K, which surprises me. I didn't realize that either. Mm. Um, and so there, there are some things that this guy is looking for uh, because he uses the camera a lot. So. So there are, there are some things they could upgrade. Yeah, and I'm glad that someone else thought of the 4K Kodak that's available in this camera. I mean, that is one thing that they did do a good job with. If you look at like the GH4, the Sony a7S Mark II, and some of the other cameras that are capable of recording 4K, uh, they're limited to 100 megabit Kodaks. Uh, Canon at least gave this guy a 300-ish uh, MXF style Kodak to go along with it. And MXF is just Canon's flavor of H.264 and 4K recording. But that's nice. I mean, no one else is doing that. Do you see anybody else uh, adding that sort of feature? No. So, I mean, good job, Canon. Uh, and the camera's on fire sale. If you want to buy one for $1,400, $1,500, eBay is the place, guys, because uh, everybody is selling this camera off. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of a jab. I'm sorry. I know. I know. All right, moving on. I've got one more thing here, and then the other two stories are Mitch's. Uh, this one is actually something surprising to me. 
Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with BGA mounts, Mitch, but uh, that is a ball grid array. And it is basically a method for soldering components onto circuit boards that allows for all of the solder points to be on the very bottom of the item. Uh, with that in mind, Samsung is releasing the PM971 VNAND SSDs, which are ultra tiny uh, SSDs that are capable of being in the capacity range of 512 meg or 12 gig to 256 gig and maybe even 128 gig in the smaller sizes. And this is really tiny, really small, probably something we're going to see in crazy fast cell phones in the future. What features do you think an SSD in your cell phone would allow you to accomplish? Uh, maybe raw 4K recording in your next Samsung sure. Galaxy S9? <laughs> yes, for those people who are making a crazy, crazy music video with their cell phone, um, that's tiny though. I mean, that's that's a lot of space in a in a cell phone. Well, not just 512 gigs worth of space, but we're talking uh, read speeds of 1500 megs a second and write speeds of 600 megs a, spec a second, which is really substantial. Uh, when I saw these numbers, and I, I thought about a 512 gig. Uh, SSD in your phone, I mean, that's almost just like the uh, monitor we were talking about a little bit ago. Uh, you could plug your phone in and use it as a, a desktop computer at that point. I mean, that's a fairly substantial amount of storage. Yep. I Yeah. It, it, it is amazing where technology is going. And, you know, I uh, Apple just added the new uh, a new smaller iPad Pro the other day. And they're offering finally SSDs up to 256K on those. Uh, so it's crazy. It's crazy. I'm excited for the future. Uh, that story, nothing else exciting to report on it other than we may see this technology also fall into possible future memory card technology, depending on the design and shape. Now, Mitch, tell me about Frame IO. Apparently, this is a method for sharing and collaborating in Premiere Pro. Well, Frame.io started and, and continues to be a website. So if you go to frame.io, uh, that is a collaboration tool. And it works really well. I've, I have played with it. I don't have a need to do a whole lot of collaboration. But let's, let's suppose you're shooting for a customer and they've got somebody in Paducah, Kentucky, and they've got somebody in uh, New York City, and they've got somebody in, I don't know, Seattle. And all of those people need to be able to review your footage before you publish your final release. Now, typically, uh, I know you mentioned before the show started that you might, you might do Google Hangouts, and you guys can sit and chat about something. Uh, but let's let's suppose one of your other reviewers is in Singapore, so you've got major time zone problems. And Frame.io allows you to upload your footage, and everybody can, on their own time frame, make comments directly in your footage and flag certain things and do markup, and then you can go through and review those those changes and make your updates and then republish the next version. And so it's it's a collaboration tool. Uh, it's not meant to be an online, let's do it right now thing. Okay. Uh, but, and, and the, I mean, you can do it sort of real time. And I, I, I mean, they say in their, their tag words, the most real time connected and advanced way to collaborate. Uh, but now what they've done is they've taken their web user interface where you can do all this collaboration, and they've created a panel inside Adobe Premiere. So you, as the editor, would be able to, instead of having a web browser open and be switching back and forth between Premiere and your web browser to, to see what comments have been made by all the different people that are doing the reviews for you, you can see it right inside of Adobe Premiere and be able to do your changes and do uploads and then instantly see any comments that are made uh, from that. So it's 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 pretty cool. I'm I'm pretty impressed. And of course, it's not available for Final Cut Pro. Uh, sorry, you guys uh, in Final Cut 10. 
Done. Now, where do the comments show up exactly? I, I'm looking at the video and it's showing kind of a timeline with uh, some faces on there and some comments, but how does that actually, have you, have you used any of this yet, Mitch, or seen it in use? I have used, I have played with, uh, with frame.io and uh, it, I don't know exactly how it's going to show up in the user interface within Adobe Premiere. I mean, it almost looks like it's going to appear in a in a little window in the upper left corner. Yeah, I'm seeing kind of this little uh, you know picture of each commenter, and uh, you know you click on the text, and then it brings up their comments. But uh, it's kind of nebulous when they show the design, you know, because right. they move on to like this is awesome, and you don't really go over it anymore after that in the video. There's there's not a whole lot of meat in the uh, in the it's a teaser video. It's not a how to or whole full details because they're still working on it and they haven't released it yet. Uh, but yeah, I, I was just impressed by the fact that, that you would be able to directly look at your video, make changes based on that without having to swap over to another tool. I mean, it's, it's, it's very impressive. <laughs> How well it works, I don't know. We haven't seen it yet. Uh, for me personally, when I'm, before the show, I mentioned this to Mitch, but I, I use Hangouts. And the, the only reason I use Hangouts is because I can share screen and continue to chat with the people that are working with me on a project and they can watch as I edit, make comments, tell me like, Oh, you know, cut this or remove that. And then what I do personally is if they are co-editors, I will share simply my premiere files and everybody will have a copy of their own assets. Uh, so they can go to the Google docs and download the latest premiere edit and then work on it from there, upload it back to Google docs, put a, a timestamp on it. And we all work off of the same one. If I'm working with a client, I can show them my screen, show them where the edits at and then make edits to that or notes with them live. If they're not at the location I'm at. And that seems to work pretty well for me, but I see all these really cool ways of interacting with people like Frame.io, and it's like, man, would that make me uh, look more professional when I'm working with these people as opposed to, all right, I just sent you a Google Hangouts link. Go ahead and click on this. I mean, that is a little bit, uh, a, a little bit ghetto. <laughs> and, and ghetto and free work, right? <laughs> I mean, Frame.io is not free, uh, but it, it, I mean, it's, it's. It's free to your users, for example. So you may you may absorb the cost or bill them for it, but they they don't have to go purchase a license in order to do the reviews, for example. So, and and there's you know emails built in when you when you publish something, everybody gets emailed, and so there's some automation functionality that improves your workflow because you don't have to go paying everybody and. When they make comments, you get emails back or, or notifications if you're online that somebody's commented. So it's it's a lot more interactive in that regard and, and less kludge, kludgy where you have to do all the work. But you know there is a big big thing to say for free. What's the uh, price on uh, Frame.io, Mitch? I'm af I'm afraid I don't know, and I didn't go look it up. Sorry. I was no, oh, that's okay. I'm skimming around to their site right now to find a a price, and it wants me to join before I can see how much it costs. Which, uh, Sorry, guys. I'm gonna do right now. All right, moving on. Last one is yours, Mitch. Before we get out of here, and I apologize, guys, for the short show again. A little sick today. Uh, let's take a what? look at Hedge. Uh, oh, this is. This is a uh, Mitch story as well. I'm not a Mac user at all. So, You're yeah, not? apparently this is some sort of method for easily copying files uh, to your PC. Mitch, can you tell me more? Uh, one of the things that I have always looked for, and I'm not a DIT, and I suspect that, that there are software tools out there on the market uh, that do this as well. I don't. I don't suspect that hedge is the first one but it's a it's a simple user interface and it's a simple way of doing multiple copies uh, and for somebody who is is doing major projects i mean so let's say for example you come home and you've got five um compact flash cards and let's suppose you have <laughs> Five compact flash readers, right? Most people okay. don't. Uh, but 
typically what you would do would be you would put your card in and then you would go to the finder in Mac and you would specify your source drive and you would copy all the files over, right? And you're trusting that the Mac is going to do the copy 100% correct. And, and sometimes things fail and, and God forbid anything fail. But with Hedge, what you do is, is you get a user interface that shows you all of your uh, drives that pop in the middle. You, put your, you drag your source files over, or your source disks over on the left side, and then you specify your source disks on the right. So let's suppose, again, you've got this one card, let's suppose you've got one card, but you want to copy it to two different drives, or three different drives if you're, if you're a smart person, you're making multiple backups, right? Okay. Well, then you, in the finder, you've got to drag it to the drive, and then you've got to start your copy, and then you drag it to the second drive, and you start your copy, and you drag it to the third drive. With Hedge, you've got your source on the left side and your, uh, your destinations on the right, and you just click a button, and it starts doing the copy for you. It does all that automatically. And if you add another drive on the source side, it automatically starts copying to all of those destinations on the destination side. So if you have multiple readers or you add some... So anyway, it's, it's, it's a very simple tool. I'm maybe not explaining it very well. A video would be much better. Um, and I think it was, uh, I think No Film School has, uh, no, Cinema 5D has a demo video you can go watch that they created. Um, have a go look at that. And right now, it's there's a special pricing if you go over to planet5d.com. And they have had such high demand. I've gotten updates from them three days in a row after we published the story because everybody is just downloading this like crazy. There's The free version will let you have, uh, I think it's one source, co co uh, one source and three destinations. But if you pay version, then you can have unlimited sources and destinations. It does all of the bit checking to make sure that every file gets copied over properly. Uh, it's it's just a nice little tool, and you can get that for right now forty nine dollars, I think, for a lifetime license. So if you go to the Planet Five D and get the code that we have uh, on our website, it's it's normally higher price than that. I think it's forty or fifty percent off right now. Uh, but it's an interesting tool, and and try the free version. If you really like it, then you buy the buy the uh, licensed version and just give it a shot. It's pretty cool. I don't hear you, DJ. I've lost your voice. And I am, I don't know what's going on here. It shows that I'm, shows that I'm on your end. Uh, Mitch, I don't know. Can you hear why. me? I can hear you just fine. Well, I hear you now. You were gone for a while. I huh. was going and your lips were lapping, but there wasn't no audience. So looking at a uh, PC equivalent, looks like a red giant has the Bulletproof program, uh, which is a similar copying application uh, for PC and I believe for Mac uh, that does a certain sort of sorting, categorizing, and placing your footage onto multiple drives simultaneously for both uh, protection as well as storage and also easy ability to search for your clips. Uh, personally, I use Lightroom, and I know that sounds a little weird, what? but... Lightroom, you can copy video just as easily as you can copy uh, photos from your memory cards. And if you set up Lightroom with a little script, you can set it to detect a video footage and send it to a folder that's different from any other folders. And you have to change that per project. But the nice thing about that is Lightroom automatically uh, categorizes by date and puts them into folders. So if you're like me and you go out with a shot list every day, uh, the shot list says what you shot on day or whatever, and you can go to your folder then and find that day. And you know that the shot you're looking for is in, you know, February 16th, 2016, for example. Uh, you know that if you shot like five days on this project, that the shot you need is going to be in, you know, whatever folder that your shot list tells you it's in. And I don't know if that's just too easy or people don't use Lightroom in that manner, but uh, it's something that's always worked really well for me. And Lightroom has it built in for you. It makes it super simple. 
Uh, I don't know. Am I the only one? Sounds like a great blog post there, DJ. Because I don't <laughs> think anybody knows about that. Oh. Hedge, Hedge does do uh, custom naming, so you can put, I mean, it will put the date and time stamps in there for you for folder names, just like you're talking about with Lightroom. Yeah. Uh, it also has scripting, so if you're, a, if you're an Apple script guy, you can customize it to whatever the heck you want it to. But do, the, do a blog post on that, because I, I bet you nobody knows that you can do that in Lightroom. Yeah, and the other thing, Lightroom will add metadata tags to your footage, so you can actually name it as like video of cat. And like every time you search for a cat, you will bring up a cat video or like Sony A7S. And it'll tell you what camera was used uh, from the metadata. So if you know you have a shoot that you did all on the GH4 and it was in between this date and this date, you just search for GH4 and bam, you have your footage. Uh, it, I think I will write something up on that. That seems like a really... Really, like sometimes you think something is simple and it's you do it all the time, but then no one else does it and it's a specialty item. So nobody ever, nobody, <laughs> nobody has the brain power that you do, DJ, to come up with these very unique ways of, of processing do it yourself kind of stuff. I mean, you're, you're fantastically unique. That's why we love you. Thanks, Mitch. I'm running at kind of half watt today, though. So <laughs> especially with this cold. On that note, guys. I think we've covered as much as we're going to make it through. Mitch, do you have anything else to add before we get out of here? Uh, NAB is coming up in like two, three weeks. I think oh, I yeah. weeks, so a little while ago when I was wrong. But uh, it's crazy close. And if you uh, are interested in working, if you happen to be going to NAB, uh, send me an email at plantmitchatme.com. We'll get you on the list of floor reporters. It's not a paid job. People still keep telling me, oh, if you're not going to pay me, I'm not going to do it. Uh, but it's fun. It's contributing to the, to the rest of the planet. We've got a whole bunch of blogs that are signing up to, uh, to show that. So we should have well more than 100,000 viewers this year. So awesome. Out there, let me know. Yeah, and uh, expect to see all of us at NAB running around. We may even get together for some sort of recording or something like that to post it during the show. Uh, on that note, guys, you can find me on at DSLRFilmNoob.com on SoundCloud. You can find this podcast. Uh, Mitch might have to help me here because I'm just stumbling over my own words as I my sick brain fails to do its job. All right. Uh Half what signing out. Half what signing out. Uh, you can find this podcast anywhere podcasts are distributed, including iTunes, SoundCloud. You can find Mitch at Planet Five D on Twitter. You can find me at DSLR Film Noob on Twitter. And of course, thanks again for watching, listening. This was episode ninety three, where DJ is just sick and rambling. We'll talk uh -huh. to you next time on another exciting episode of DSLR Film Noob Podcast. Bye. Oh, I need to blow my nose. Oh, that's why you're in. Yeah, I didn't want to do it on camera, but uh, I had to just, you know, it's gross. As long as it's, it's not gross. dripping out your nose, then don't tell me about it. <laughs> I, oh. I've been sick for three weeks straight. Uh, they've oh. given me uh, antibiotics and a bunch of other things, and none of it seems to really do the trick. I'm just continue to have like a horrible head cold and I thought it was allergies, but no, I just, every so often I run a fever and get sick and it's, it's getting really obnoxious. So, you know, uh, showing up to projects, coughing on people and getting snot all over everything is not right. the best way to put your good foot forward. Yeah. Yeah. And then you do Google hangouts with them and gosh, they think, man, this guy's so unprofessional. Oh man. No joke. Ah. Uh, I can't even, I, my, I'm fuddled too a little bit because uh, my head cold kind of unbalances me. So then I start going and it's not all there. Uh, things aren't working at 100%. <laughs> you, you can feel it. You're like, I know the word for this, but uh, where is it? I can't find it. I have that problem all the time, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I, I feel like you're usually on top of it most of the time. Most Especially of the you got me beat today, man. You were you were a number one today. <laughs> couldn't do well, the show without you, Mitch. Hard. Huh? What? I said I couldn't do the show without you, Mitch. Oh yeah, you could. You skip a week. All right. On that note, guys, I'm gonna end the live broadcast now. Uh, take care. Happy Easter. I think it's Easter, isn't it? Yes, sir.
Sunday. Yeah. Did you see that hor oh, before we go? Did you see that horrible thing about candy containing lead? No. Uh, apparently, uh, they did testing on 50 different uh, chocolates that are made specifically for Easter, and like 20 of them had oh. lead and cadmium in it to a degree that would make them illegal to be sold in the United States. Oh, my gosh. And it's like, what? And they're like, well, we buy the chocolate from a certified chocolate group, and so we don't even check it when it gets to our factories. Does it come from China? <laughs> Probably. Well. Um, they got the uh, the kid uh, toy paint toys sitting right next to the chocolate manufacturing plant. Which, I don't know how it got contaminated. We had some extra lead paint and threw it in there. Yeah. We wanted it to be extra bright colors. <laughs> More vivid <laughs> chocolate. <laughs> yeah. Oh, mercy. All right. So be safe on Easter. Uh, watch out for that danger chocolate. Yeah. Talk to you later, guys. Bye.